Father, we thank you for bringing us here today. We thank you that your Holy Spirit is already here, that the anointing is here, and you working in our midst. Lord, we ask that you would continue to work amongst us this morning. Lord, I pray, Father, for this word this morning, Lord. I pray, Lord Jesus, that it will hit the right people in the right way, Lord. I pray, Father God, that you uh, would get your message that you need to get through to us this morning, um, as you already have with those scriptures, Lord, that feeds directly into what you're saying. There's confirmation of the word being the right word for this morning. Father, as Arthur has already prayed there, Lord, let us not be afraid in these days, but let us stand firm and look up for our redemption draws near. So, Holy Spirit, we welcome you here this morning and ask, Lord, that you would anoint my lips, that all words and any words that come through my lips will be directly from your throne room, and may any other words fall to the ground, and may only your words hit the hearts of the people here, Lord, we pray. Father, we pray that you would speak to our hearts and change our lives in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. This uh, today is uh, not just an individual sermon, it's, it's part of two sermons. I will say from the outset, you need to be here tonight as well to get the full part of the message. Uh, I'll just say that from the outset and I'll repeat it later just to remind you as well. Um, war is never pretty, is it? Really? Has anyone ever seen a pretty war? Has anyone ever seen an organized war? Has anyone ever seen a war that is going according to the exact plans? I don't think so. The nature of war itself is never desirable, but it is something that is the reality of our living in a fallen world. It's the reality of a fallen world. War is for a time for now because of evil, but there is coming a day when war will be no more because evil will be no more. And the events just over three weeks ago in Israel on Saturday the 7th of October, I believe they were significant. Not just because they were significant events, but I believe they have spiritual significance in the course of the existence of this world. It shocked the world. The world responded. Whenever else have you seen so many capital cities lit up in the colors of Israel before? And I remember people saying to me, oh, look at this, this is so exciting, people turning to support Israel. I said, their support is feeble, just wait till they hit back, fast forward a week, and then you'll see who really supports Israel. And now, folks, we start to see that. We start to see that evil, pernicious spirit of anti-Semitism rising up that's been there under the surface, but is now right there out in the open. This attack from Hamas on Israel, will have and is already having global ramifications. And it will result, I'm afraid to say, I think in a prolonged war. Even Mr. Netanyahu yesterday says we're moving into the next phase, but this is not going to be quick. This is not just a a quick in and out. This is a much bigger thing. And folks, we need to understand that we will not be excluded from this conflict. It is naive to think that we can just carry on with life as normal because we simply cannot. Because normal is no more. There is no such thing as normal. You know, we had this thing previously with that, that, that little flu thing that went on a few years ago where people were talking about the new normal. Yeah? Well, this now is, as it were, the new normal. It's normal to wake up. At least it has been for the last three weeks and find more developments in the Middle East. I believe that these barbaric acts cross the world over into a new era of spiritual warfare. Just when we thought we might have reached the apex of evil, just when we thought we might have seen the tip of evil with regards to what ISIS was doing a few years ago, Hamas seemed to have found another level of demonic activity. I'm not going to go into the details of what they did. There's plenty of information out there if you want to find out if you're not yet aware but suffice to say it passed by even the sort of people that write horror films in Hollywood they could not have come up with the concepts that Hamas came up with to slaughter the innocent in their own homes and now much has been said about these events where do they fall into the prophetic timeline what does this say where are we at are we at these birth pangs or is the Lord coming back today tomorrow is he even coming back just now 
I want to say, folks, we're not primarily focused on that here today. Why? Because where we are on a prophetic timeline is not intrinsic to the gospel. It's not central. It's an important factor, yes, but it's not intrinsic to being saved. You can debate for your entire life whether prophecy is even a real thing, but if you have not accepted the Lord Jesus as your Lord and your Savior, then you are not saved. So we need to focus first on the gospel and other things follow afterwards. And I believe here God would ask ourselves this simple question today. Are you ready for his return? Are you ready for his return? Because I want to tell you folks, Christ is coming back, and he's not coming back as a humble baby in a stable in Bethlehem this time. He's coming back as a glorious king to rule and to reign. I wrote down in my notebook a few months ago uh, three words uh, that I, I, I felt led to write down and I thought okay maybe that's for a future message maybe that's a future title I didn't really understand it I put it aside and then when I was writing some notes for this sermon series and I was writing just some headline bullet points I'm sitting there and I'm looking at it and I'm thinking oh wow these three words absolutely fit in refreshing restoring and reviving refreshing restoring and reviving everyone say refreshing, refreshing. everyone say restoring restore. everyone say reviving these three things, the three R's, as I like to call them, is what God is in the business of. And I want to tell you from the outset today, we've heard that scripture that Linda shared. We've heard the prayer that Arthur re responded with. If you are feeling fearful today, if you are feeling anxious, if you're feeling afraid because you wake up and you put on the news and you see the headlines and you see the strife and you see everything that's going on, I want to tell you that God today is in the business of refreshing, restoring, and reviving. And if you're in need of a restora restoration, if you're in need of reviving, if you're in need of refreshing, then God is your portion today. Christ Jesus is your portion today. Amen. You know, in the 1920s and the 1930s, when the world was uh, recovering from the Great War, from World War I, the war to end all wars, as they said, how wrong they were, sadly. Most ignored the evil that was rising again. And very, very few people were speaking out about the evil that was coming. Very few people were speaking about the rising danger except for one in Parliament, Mr. Winston Churchill, who stood alone in calling for rearmament at a time when there was calls for disarmament. And, and, and he said in a speech, uh, he said, we are asking France to reduce its arms and reduce its air force and so on and so forth, and we are making a commitment to them that they'll be absolutely fine because if they should ever come under the same sort of attack that they came under before, we will come to their rescue. And Winston Churchill stood in Parliament and he said, but I wonder what exactly they expect us to come to their rescue with. Because our own military was so totally and utterly gutted and decimated and there was no appetite for rebuilding it. Why? Because of the devastation of World War I. And so in response, people considered Churchill a warmonger. Oh, he's stirring up war again. There he goes. He's just getting carried away with himself. But far from being a warmonger, Churchill was awake to the rising danger that was brewing. He was sounding the alarm, and he was urging people to prepare. War-wearied people after the aftermath of World War I had been lulled to sleep. They were trying to pretend that all would be peace forevermore. Moreover, they wanted to believe that another war would not come around. And so because of this belief, they didn't want to see any potential warning signs. And today we are in a similar position. Many are asleep, slumbering, pretending and wishing that it's all peace and safety, both inside and outside the church. People are going on with life as if it's just going to go on as it is forever. People dipping in and out of church at their convenience. Where folks, if you don't get your firm footing and your firm foundation with Christ just now, you're going to get a nasty shock in the years to come. Fortunately, we have a God who loves us. A God who never leaves and never forsakes. God who will never leave us lacking and who always provides for our needs, whatever they may be. 
God who wants to see us prosper, to run and to not grow weary. And my prayer today is that over the course of this message that we, that we would heed the call of the alarm, that we would wake up, that we would get ready and that we would be on the alert. It's important we're aware of the times that we live in so we know what to do. We read of that, of the sons of Issachar who discerned the signs and the seasons and what that meant and because they did that they then knew how to act, they knew how to respond, they knew how to be. Was it a time for war? Was it a time for peace? Was it a time for building up? Was it a time for storing? They knew what to do based on discerning the signs and the seasons and I want to tell you today folks whether you like it or not it's war. That's the season that we're in just now. And there's no point pretending otherwise. So folks, this is a heavy word. I'm fully aware of that. I have had this burden on me now for the best part of three weeks. But it's not designed to beat us down. It's designed to build us up. It's a sobering word, yes, but it causes us hopefully to prepare for what is coming down the line. From the outset, let us be reminded of Romans 8, 38 to 39, that nothing can separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. Nothing. Absolutely nothing. In the process of studying and praying about this word, I heard the Lord say that what we have seen in the last few weeks is absolutely nothing compared to what we're going to see down the line. That might scare you. But it need not, because God will be right alongside you. Well, folks, don't be surprised when this jihad that we see on the other side of the world breaks out on our own shores. It's already landed here. That's the reality. Even just yesterday, an estimated over 100,000 people were on the streets of London rallying against Israel. And they either don't know what they're actually chanting for or they actually do. And that's even more concerning. Either way, the devil is using those people to promote his cause. And the truth is there is a large number of people in this country whose allegiance is not to this country or its people. Their allegiance is not even to any other country. Their allegiance is to a demonic power. A demonic power. And that prevailing demonic power right now is the spirit of Islam. And I say that very carefully. Because people will trot out all sorts of tropes of, oh, he's just being Islamophobic. No, to be a phobic, you have to be scared. I'm not scared of Islam. I'm scared for the people that are in Islam. Because I want them to be saved and brought into the kingdom of heaven. You see, if you understand the Islamic doctrine of immigration and how it works, then you'll understand that what is happening in Western civilization today is no accident whatsoever. It is a very deliberate program that has been on a mission creep for many, many decades. And now the Muslim population within this country and other similar countries in the West is reaching the point of confidence where they can be a lot more Islamic, where they can start to enforce their Islamic ideals. Do you ever think that people at the crack of dawn would be praying to Allah on their knees in Whitehall at the Cenotaph even just a couple of years ago? I don't think so. I don't think they had the confidence to do so, but they know that they have reached the point of confidence now with critical mass so they can do those sorts of things. And it's sad to see. There's no point getting angry about it. But it's sad to see it. Arthur mentioned already last week, Islam is not our friend and we need to be careful who we consider our friend to be. Islam stands for many things that we stand for. So it would be very, when you look at the indoctrination of our children in schools, Islam and Muslims will stand against it. And often when you organize protests, it will be Muslims that are there more than Christians because they are awake to these things. But we need to be careful that we don't see them as allies Yes, maybe use them to bring along extra people to a campaign. But don't for a minute think that you can trust people whose ultimate aim is the overthrow of Christianity. First the Saturday folk and then the Sunday folk. And Islam is a system. It's not a religion. It's a political system that is set up 
against God. It sometimes has the pretty face of peace, but it's a deceptive spirit that's behind it. It sucks in many, and many more have believed the lie of it being a religion of peace. How many times have you heard that sort of phrase? Normally after a terrorist attack that's clearly an Islamically motivated terrorist attack, and every single time uh, the media will roll out some uh, liberal Muslim who will then say, ah, oh, well, it's all just about peace and these people don't speak for me. Well, just as we've got liberals in the church that don't adhere to orthodox teaching from the Bible, there are liberals within Islam that don't adhere to the truth of the Quran. I go by the general rule that if you need to keep stating that you're a religion of peace, the chances are you might not actually be so. So we need to be praying for every single Muslim. It's not about hating Muslims, absolutely not. It's exactly the opposite. We need to be praying they will meet Jesus as their Lord and Savior, rescued from the deception that they're caught in. And I want to tell you folks, you might look out in society and you might be cowed uh, by what you see. It's understandable. But then I want you to look at countries like Iran, where God is doing that just now. Where it's illegal to spread the gospel, where it's illegal to have a church, where it's illegal to hold a Bible, and yet it's one of the fastest growing places where the church is growing the most in any country in the world. Well, how is that happening? Well, in many various ways, but one of the most common ways seems to be that Jesus is meeting people in dreams. They're seeing visions of Jesus and they're waking up and they're responding. And secretly, they're becoming believers and followers in Christ. Christ is rescuing those for whom missionaries cannot be sent to. You see how much he loves people? Even people that are caught up in a demonically inspired religion and a system that sets itself up against God and God still has his arms open and he says, come to me. It's worth us reflecting how we can show the love of Christ to Muslims and people of any other faith around us. I operate by a simple principle, reach out and resist. Reach out in love to those who are of a different persuasion, but resist the agenda. It means don't compromise on the truth and make sure they know where you stand. Make sure they know where your lines are and don't shift from them. But at the same time, make sure that you reach out to them and show them the love of Christ. So this is the first of three parts. So today we're going to look at preparing for war. This evening we'll look at fighting the war. And then at a later date we'll look at prevailing in war. Preparing, fighting, prevailing. Three stages. And let me be clear, primarily for the purpose of the recording, before anyone starts to think that this is me somehow calling for a new crusade and we're all going to go and get some actual armory on afterwards and then board a battle bus and just take George Square by force. No, it's not. The, we are concerned here with spiritual war. Spiritual war. Because that's where the warfare really is. When you see physical war in society, it's a manifestation of what is already going on in the spiritual realm. So we need to be involved at that spiritual level and not get bogged down at the physical. God is going to do something new in your life today, in amongst all of the strife and chaos, if you would open your heart and allow him to do so. So how do we prepare? Well, there's three stages. Waking up, getting ready, and being alert. I think most of us can assimilate with uh, most of those things. It looks like most of us, a few, doubtful, but most of us have woken up this morning. Most, have a quick look around, see what we're dealing with. Most, most have got ready, yes, yes, absolutely. I think we, we seem to be ready. And some look alert. So these are things that we go about with in the daily course of life, really, aren't they? I had a teacher at school uh, who was actually a teacher who gave me the passion for history. And he, uh, he had this phrase that he would chant out every single day uh, uh, in the run-up to exams, in assembly, in front of everyone. Uh, he, 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 would go, uh, um, he would go E minus, uh, however many days it was to the first day of exams. Um, and he would get more and more emphatic. He was almost preaching in a non-spiritual way. And he had this phrase where he said, "Prepare to fa uh, fail to prepare and prepare to fail. And that's what we need to be doing today, to, folks. We need to do the opposite of that phrase. We need to prepare ourselves now so that we don't fail later when the test comes. 
We need to prepare now so we don't fail when the test comes. We've got a window just now. We need to use it before it's too late. God wants us match fit, ready for battle. He doesn't want us caught off guard. Those of you that follow football uh, will be aware of the concept of counter-attack. Those of you who are not, I'll explain it briefly. One of the basic tactics in football uh, is if you know that you've got a a team that's um, quite defensive, they'll all kind of sit back, but every now and then they'll get a chance to uh, uh, suddenly flood forward, and the hope is that you can exploit weaknesses in the opposition team. It's called a counter-attack. In war, it's often seen as a counter-offensive. You you catch people by the element of surprise, and you just go for it. It's all about tactics and strategy. So we're going to focus this morning on uh, Scripture. The main portion of our Scripture is going to be from 1 Thessalonians and chapter 5. So if you can turn uh, there with me, uh, we're going to read the first 24 verses in that chapter. And if you don't have a Bible with you, then the word should come up on the screen behind me. Praise God. 1 Thessalonians in chapter 5, reading from the beginning of the chapter there. Now concerning the times and the seasons, brothers, you have no need to have anything written to you. For you yourselves are fully aware that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. While people are saying there is peace and security, then sudden destruction will come upon them as labor pains come upon a pregnant woman and they will not escape. But you are not in darkness, brothers, for that day to surprise you like a thief. For you are all children of light, children of the day. We are not of the night or of the darkness. So then let us not sleep as others do, but let us keep awake and be sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk are drunk at night. But since we belong to the day, let us be sober, having put on the breastplate of faith and love, and for a helmet, the hope of salvation. There's elements of the armor of God, which we're going to look at more uh, tonight there in more detail verse 9 for God has not destined us for wrath but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ who died for us so that whether we are awake or asleep we might live with him therefore encourage one another and build one another up just as you are doing we ask you brothers to respect those who labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you and to esteem them very highly in love because of their work Be at peace among yourselves, and we urge you, brothers, admonish the idle, encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, be patient with them all. See that no one repays anyone evil for evil, but always seek to do good to one another and to everyone. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances, in all circumstances. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Do not quench the spirit, do not despise prophecies, but test everything. Hold fast to what is good. Abstain from every form of evil. Now may the God of peace sanctify you completely, or holy as other translations may say, and may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful, he will surely do it. So waking up, I wonder, how how, how do you wake up? Are you the sort of person that wakes up suddenly? There's people in my family that I know that can just go, boom, they can go from completely asleep to completely awake. Uh, My my, my sister used to sit in the passenger seat of my car when we were driving from London to Scotland, um, and there was uh, one particularly memorable occasion I remember. She's like a lot of the, the, the females, they love to take, half their bedding with them just to go on a basic car journey um, and, and, and you know, she's there with the duvet and then she's got the car socks and the car slippers and, and everything else and then there's a hot water bottle and you know it's a total chaos you can just about get yourself settled into the car and oh I've forgotten the hot water bottle in we go unlock the whole house boil the kettle get the whole oh where's the hot water bottle it goes on and on but anyway she gets herself very uh, comfy in the car very settled uh, and, and within a short while that's it she's off to sleep I thought excellent I'll just play my podcasts and, uh, and, and you know play the one she doesn't like and she'll never hear anything she's a very deep sleeper so you could, you know, you could basically just sort of tell her that she's a dreadful person. She would never know. Um, obviously, you wouldn't do that. But that's how deep she sleeps. She wouldn't hear anything. And um, 
uh, on this particular journey, we set off. Now, I normally just go London to Scotland doof, overnight, one, one hit, no stop, just go. Uh, and you do it overnight, you can do it very quickly. Roads are much more quiet. Um, and on this occasion, I just, I wasn't tired, I just felt like I needed uh, uh, some food. So I stopped at a service station, and I sort of, I just sat there for a minute, and I just looked at my sister, and I thought, ah, she's not stirring, that's fine. Just go and locked her in the car, left her there. I was in the shop, I was in Burger King, or whatever it was, for about half an hour or so. I got back, she obviously hadn't even stirred, right? And I had to have a two-course meal in that time, and she, she hadn't even stirred. Uh, and, and, and we carried on the journey, um, and uh, then we were coming down this hill towards where, near where we live, and she just woke up and she went, oh, Enfield. And that was that. You know, she had gone to sleep two junctions in on the M74, woke up 378 miles later, nothing in between, no wreck. I said, did you know that we stopped for half an hour? No. You know, the, the jolting around, the sudden acceleration, deceleration. No, nope, no, nope. didn't notice that at all. Did, were you not there when I had to slam on the brakes because someone pulled out in front of me out? And no, no, didn't notice any of it. You, she, she had no concept of it whatsoever, but she was suddenly awake. And when she was awake, boy, was she fully awake. She didn't go back to sleep. So maybe you're a suddenly person, or maybe you're a slowly person like me. It takes you multiple uh, lengths of time to wake up. This morning was no different. I, I don't feel like I actually had the extra hour. Um, I don't know about anyone else, but I kind of, I, I went to bed last night thinking, oh, that's great news, fantastic, I get a bit of extra sleep and then I'll wake up and it'll be easy. I just did exactly what I normally do, snooze, 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 hope that you press snooze rather than stop. Um, and you, you look at it and you think, what's going on here? And uh, I wonder, maybe you're the sort of person that wakes up somehow automatically. My father's never needed an alarm, even if he wakes up at a different time to when he normally does. I don't understand how that works, but it does. Myself, I need multiple alarms. And when I was at school, I hated waking up. Not because I hated school, I just hated the concept of waking up. I find bed quite comfortable. Um, and uh, I, I, I'd have to set multiple alarms. And, and I remember hiding alarm clocks in drawers elsewhere in the room and setting them. And you know, so you had to get out of bed. And the, the idea is, now that you're out of bed, then you'll just sort of stay out of bed. Didn't always work. I just went, thank goodness, I stopped that noise and get back to bed. Um, and, and, and invariably, I was then late. Uh, for, for school, but, but, but that, that, that's fine. Anyway, um, but one, one, one thing for sure is that once you're awake, you know you're awake, right? You know you're awake. But look at it the other way. If you're asleep, do you know that you're asleep? There's that little window, isn't there, where you're sort of drifting off to sleep and you can still hear the world around you, but you're not consciously saying, oh, this is me, I'm nearly asleep. Let's just stay in this place and you'll be asleep. It's just, a pro you don't know that you're asleep. Has anyone had a general anesthetic before in a, by, by way of surgery? And, you know, you can feel yourself going to, going to sleep, but you, you don't know that you're actually asleep until you wake up and you sort of look at your leg and it's been sliced in 15 different ways. And you think, well, goodness gracious, what's happened here? Arthur said before, it's a wake-up call. That was a, that was a title of a sermon before, it's a wake-up call. And, and the, the important point there was that the responsibility is on all of us individually to wake up. Some of us have been slumbering for far too long. I slumber most days in the process of waking up. Oh, just another five minutes here, to do 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 Half an hour goes by. You, you, you've not actually achieved anything. Just slumbering. I'm awake, but I'm not. I'm just slumbering. I'm in a state of not being sleeping, but not active either. Wasting time. Maybe Jesus has been allowed to take a back seat in your life. Some of us have missed the warning signs of what's going on in the world because we've been slumbering, because we've been asleep. I want to tell you this morning, it is time to wake up and change that. Jesus' disciples were asked to keep watch whilst Jesus went and prayed, and they fell asleep. And Jesus rebuked them. And he says, ah, oh, well, you see, the spirit may be willing, but the flesh is weak. And this passage that we've read here in Thessalonians, verse 6, it says, let us watch and be sober. Watch and be sober. Those who are drunk cannot watch. It's the reason why we have drink-driving laws, is because your judgment an ability to react quickly is diminished under the influence of alcohol. So that's why it's not a good idea to drink when you're under the influence of such substances. Uh, not a good idea to drink. It's probably not a good idea to drink anyway. It's got a good idea to drive, certainly. 
get the words right here. Um, but you see, these, the, the, these are serious times, folks. Serious times. Does that mean we can't have a laugh at points in life? Absolutely not, because God wants us to be able to enjoy life as well. But we need to realize that overall, we are living in serious times. And it's not a time for slumbering. It's not a time for mucking around. And it's certainly not a time for burying our head in the sand. When I was leaving the prayer meeting here on Friday night, a small confession, I put heart radio on. I love a bit of Friday night club classics. You hear some of these songs now, and you pause, and you think, that's not a club classic. And then you realize it's been out for about 25 years. And you think, my goodness gracious, you know, that's, that's not right. I mean, how's that possible? I, anyway, uh, the song that was playing was this song by Avicii, quite a well-known DJ if you're aware of that sort of music. Uh, and it's called Wake Me Up was playing. Uh, and I quite like this song. It's got quite a kind of upbeat um, tone to it. Um, and, uh, but, but when you look at the lyrics, it tells a somewhat different story. The lyrics start out well by saying, oh, yes, there's great value in life. I've got purpose. I'm driven. Keep me awake. Keep me awake. And then it turns out to be rather sad because it says, I know I should be awake, but I can't be bothered. I know I should be awake, but pff, just leave me alone. Let me bury my head in the sand. Let me hide under the duvet. Let me sit in the bunker. Just wake me up when it's all over. That's the line that it says. Wake me up when it's all over. Once it's all passed by, wake me up. The hurricane's coming in, I'll just bunker on down, wake me up. Let me pretend that I can just get by. But let me tell you, the hurricane's coming in the bunker as well, folks. You hide in the bunker all you want, but it's not going to save you from the hurricane this time. The war is here, not any one of us will escape it. There's no option to hide and sit it out. In 2015, I went through a process for about a year, year and a half of really trying to discern what it is that God wanted me to do uh, in life. I was lacking a little bit of purpose, shall we say, in direction. And I had this great spiritual awakening, and God showed me the true state of things in our society. I was aware of little bits here and there, but I wasn't really truly aware of the levels of depravity that was going on in our society. I, I, I wasn't really aware of how bad things were spiritually because I had been operating primarily in the natural realm. But after that awakening, it changed. It flipped the other way. I see things now primarily in the spiritual rather than the physical because that's where it starts. You see, I believe we need to be aware of things. We need to be awake to things. We need to be concerned for things and we need to be praying about things. I rattled through that pretty quickly. Let me work that out. Backwards. What are you going to pray about if you're not concerned about things? And how can you be concerned about things if you are not awake to the spiritual significance of those things? And how on earth can you be awake to those things if you are not even aware of them in the first place? Right? So we need to become aware of things. We need to become awake to the spiritual significance, which should cause us to be concerned, not worried, concerned about these things, which should lead us to our knees and crying out to the living God to petition him on behalf of whatever the situation or circumstances. Verse 2, Jesus will come as a thief in the night, but only to those who are asleep. We don't know the exact hour and day that Jesus is going to come back. But if we are awake, we'll be able to spot the signs and the seasons. Jesus said that there, he, he's left us some clues, as it were, with signs and seasons. But he's not told us the exact day and time he's coming back. Why? Because he doesn't actually even know himself. It's only God the Father who knows. The world right now is literally walking into oblivion. Verse 3, for when they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them. Sudden destruction. The world will be going about their business as if everything is normal, and then there'll be a suddenly. Much wailing and gnashing of teeth on that day. Remember the little situation a few years ago with lockdowns? Everyone was caring about their business going into the clubs, partying away, having a great time, going to the football, going to restaurants, eating out with friends, socializing. And then suddenly, boom, all shuts down. And you know what happened there? A lot of people found no other point in life. Suicides went through the roof during lockdown. Because 
all of those things that people had put their hope in, had found their purpose in, that they thought was a firm foundation, things like football, suddenly wasn't there. And then they had nothing. Or so they thought. So the alarm is sounding. Will you respond to it? You see, right now, every day, there's alarms sounding in Israel with rockets coming over to them from Hamas. You can't escape the sound of these alarms. They're very loud, deliberately. They're meant to interrupt whatever you're doing. The point is, are we going to respond to the alarm or are we just going to say, oh, there goes another alarm? Alarms come to you as a shock because it's designed to get you to do something. Jesus is crying out to each of us today and he's saying, wake up! Wake up. So once we're awake, we need to get ready. And I wonder, uh, just as how long does it take you to wake up, how long does it take you to get ready? Are you the sort of person that can just slip on clothes, shoes, jacket, pick up the keys and wallet and jump straight out the door? (laughs) Or are you the sort of person that needs to start that process some hours, perhaps days beforehand? You know, I always kid myself on that ah, it's fine, I can wake up in the morning and you can uh, iron the shirt in the morning and things like that. And you wake up in the morning and because I'm no good at waking up, I never leave time to do these sort of things. You wake up, oh, there's no shirt now, I've got to get the ironing board out. And the, you turn around and then you, you're going to have a shower and you come back, oh, I haven't put the iron on and now you have to wait for it to heat up. And it's all a bit of a chaos. Basically, I need a housekeeper, uh, apply on a postcard. Um, but... Some people uh, take a long time to prepare. Others can do it very quickly. The point is we need to prepare. And however you prepare, you know yourself how long it takes. We need to be ready for war. We need to be in a state of readiness for war. I asked at the start, are you ready for Jesus' return? Are you ready for Jesus to return? If he was to return right now and walk in through that door... Would he find you ready, waiting, or have you still got some things to do to get ready? Would he find you in your spiritual pajamas or dressed and waiting by the door? Now is not a time to pretend it's all normal because we're at war. We are at war against the devil and every form of evil that sets itself up against God. Every deceptive spirit that is masquerading as light in our world today, we come against it. In Jesus' name. And I want to tell you folks, this war that we see right now in earth, on earth, is just part of the greater spiritual war. It's a war, folks, that started in heaven. Yes, it started in heaven. What do you mean by that, Stuart? I heard somebody say, but hold on a second, I thought heaven was a place of perfection. Yes, heaven is a place of perfection, and that's why this war started there. You see, Lucifer was actually in charge of worship. He was in charge of worship as one of the exalted angels in heaven who was responsible for the worship to God. And what he did is he he tried to change that worship to make it all about himself. He tried to usurp the position and the power of God. And so God could not and would not stand for that. And he cast him out. And he said, you cannot do that. You will be under my authority. And he says, no, no, I will not. And he rebelled, and God cast him out to hell, up to hell, and he took a third of the angels, the Bible tells us he took a third of the angels with him that became demons. And those are those demons that are now masquerading around society, trying to find the next victim. We've had demons in this place before. We just cast them out in Jesus' name. There's no need to make a great song and dance about it. We just deal with it. But learn to spot the signs. You know, if you could see demons then we'd probably respond slightly different to how we do. Are you ready to take up your spiritual warfare weapons? We'll look at the armor this evening. But right now, here's how we get match fit. So Thessalonians has seven, interesting, it's seven, isn't it? God's number, significant number, things to say here, of stages of getting ready for war. None of them are defensive. They are all offensive actions that we must decide in ourselves to actively take. And if we do, it will advance the kingdom of God and it will push back the kingdom of Satan. It will advance and take forward the kingdom of God. It will push back and defeat the kingdom of Satan. So what are these things? Well, 
Firstly, we are asked, we are told to rejoice forever. Psalm 92, 1 and 2, it says, It is good to give thanks to the Lord, to sing praises to your name, O Most High, to declare your steadfast love in the morning and your faithfulness by night. Morning, noon, and night, let us praise the Lord. Let us rejoice always and be glad for what God has done for us. It's a state of mind, folks. It's significant that this is first because it suggests that everything else flows from there. If you're struggling in your life, try waking up and just praising God, regardless of circumstances. Praise God first. And if you don't know how to praise God, turn to the book of Psalms. Start at 150, which is all about praising God, and work your way backwards from there. Within half an hour, you'll find you'll be praising God for a good half hour every morning. And when you do that, just watch as your circumstances change. Secondly, we are to pray continuously. Prayer, folks, is our communication to, with God. It's very simple. People make all kind of wonderful things and, oh, we must be in certain robes and certain times of day. Do you know, various other religions make certain requirements on being able to pray. That's the great thing with Jesus. We can just pray. We just talk to him. Driving in the car, I was here on the way here this morning. I was just talking to Jesus. We should be communicating with him all the time in all circumstances. Thirdly, give thanks in all circumstances. Now notice when I was reading it, I read it twice. Why? It, there's an important dis- word of distinction there. It's the word in. Give thanks in all circumstances. We're not to give thanks for all circumstances, but in all circumstances. The simple reason for that is not every circumstance is of God or from God. God may have permitted certain circumstances to happen. You read the book of Job, terrible calamities came upon him, but it was only because God had allowed the devil to get to him. God had permitted the devil to get to him. But those circumstances were not designed by God. They were not offered by God. So we give thanks in every circumstance for what God is going to do in those circumstances, but we do not give thanks for every circumstance. It's important to discern whether these circumstances are from God or from elsewhere. Next, quench not the spirit. This word quench is to sort of put out. You know, when you leave a campsite, you quench the fire. You, you pour cold water on it to fully extinguish it. Put simply, what it's saying here is don't put limitations on the Holy Spirit. Don't deny the work of the Holy Spirit. There's so much of a move of cessationism within certain parts of the church now. Cessationists simply believe that the works of the Holy Spirit, the gifts of the Holy Spirit, are for the times of the Bible but not for now. That's a total lie. If that was a lie, we wouldn't be seeing words like the word that Linda gave us this morning. Because God spoke to her through that and gave her the scripture that she then read out. That's a gift of the Holy Spirit. We wouldn't see prophesies. We wouldn't see healings. We wouldn't see demons being cast out. But yet we do. Because the word of God is a living and active document. And if God is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore, then the gifts that were there yesterday must be there today and tomorrow. Otherwise, God has changed. And if God has changed, it throws into doubt everything else that's in the book here. Well, folks, as Leonard Ravenhill once said, either the Bible is absolute or it's obsolete. It's either absolute or it's obsolete. We don't pick and choose bits of scriptures that happen to please us here. We believe it all. Say the whole, whole truth. Next, it says, test things to find the truth in everything. Don't just believe everything you see, hear, and read. Remember, it's a spiritual war. Deception is everywhere. Even as 2 Corinthians 11 and 14 says, the devil is disguised sometimes as an angel of light. Test for the truth. Know how to spot truth. 1 John 4 and 1. Next, we are to stand firm in goodness and truth. Hold fast to that which is good. There's an active and, uh, if you like, offensive role here, not just a defensive one. Holding fast actually refers to actively holding down those who proclaim lies, those who claim the truth to be false. Vines says in, in his um, exploration of the, of, the, of the scriptures, he says that we do this, why? Because we restrain the spread of truth by their unrighteousness. So by holding fast to the truth, we are holding down those that push lies 
which restrains the spread of truth by their unrighteousness. So if we allow their unrighteousness to prevail, then truth does not spread. We've got a duty to stand firm on the truth and not be afraid to proclaim it. The truth of Christ as Savior. Thinking on the things above and not below, Philippians 4.8, the fruits of the Spirit of Galatians 5. We need to avoid, next, the appearance of evil. This is always a key one that struck me. When I was younger in the faith, it was one thing to be avoiding sin. It's quite another to avoid the appearance of sin. There's a big challenge there. Abstain means to hold oneself from. Don't, folks, play fast and loose with the devil. Don't think that you can test the devil. Because you'll find yourself being put in temptation's way and you're leaning away from God and you're putting yourself in a very dangerous situation. But avoiding the appearance of evil, of sin, also involves ensuring that we don't place others around us in a position of temptation. So, for example, if I have a friend who used to be an alcoholic, it would probably not be a good idea to say, hey, should we go out for a few pints to catch up? Right? It would be far more responsible to go for a coffee instead. Right? That's not because I don't drink or I disapprove of alcohol. I, I, I do. But it's about looking after those around us. And verse 23 states that if we do these things, the God of peace will sanctify you holy. Holy, not a single part of us left out, every sinew of our very being transformed by the power of the Holy Spirit. We're preserved so that when Christ returns, we'll be found a spotless bride ready for him. And as he changes us through the power of his Holy Spirit, we should see these features become more prominent in our lives. So those are the stages of getting ready. So we're awake, we're ready, and now we need to be alert. So how do we get alert? Well, 1 Peter refers to the enemy prowling around like a lion waiting to devour his next victim. It's a very graphic illustration of how the devil wanders around society. Oh, who's there? Someone? No. Oh, there's someone in the church that wasn't there this Sunday. There's a bit of a weakness. Let's see if I can get hold of them. Missing one Sunday becomes two, becomes three, becomes four, and then suddenly the football takes precedence or something else. Once we're awake and ready, we need to be alert. It's a state of being alert to the warning signs, being able to spot warning signs by it from a distance so that we're not taken by surprise when the danger arrives. I was watching a documentary a couple of days ago on, on, on a, on a well-known broadcaster. I won't say the name of it because it's um, blasphemous to say it, but it involves the letters B, B, and C. Um, but uh, it was on um, the army training camp in Catholic, um, and um, it's very interesting that the, the new recruits were out there, um, and uh, they were on uh, camp on an exercise as part of their training program, and they were suddenly struck by various pyrotechnics to, to, to scare them unexpectedly. And you see, the thing is, they weren't even awake. They were sleeping to begin with. They weren't ready to evacuate their camp because they were all set up and happily resting. And one person was very, very slow to respond to this situation and took a long time to pack all his stuff up. He places the rest of the group in harm's way. All because, collectively, they failed to be on the alert from the start. And they could not be alert because they'd fallen asleep. If you want to prevail, you need to be alert at all times. Relax, and the devil will pounce. Just look around society, folks, at the chaos, the confusion, absolutely everywhere. Look at the state of education, the attacks on free speech, crime out of control, abortion, the state of the government, sexuality and gender confusion, the media, and so on. It all happened because the church went to sleep and took off, took leave of absence from its guard. And it permitted a secular state to come in and take over. At each stage, the church has not been alert. The church has not been the watchman on the wall. And it's made a way for the devil to come in and not just take over civic society, but folks, part of the church as well. We saw that a few years ago when most of the church bowed down and shut themselves down because the government told them to. Yeah. 
So we are, as I said earlier, declaring war on the devil. Those Hamas terrorists that entered southern Israel came to create terror. Well, folks, let us be the one that causes terror to the devil. Huh? Let us be the ones that rises up with the power of the Holy Spirit and the devil sitting there cowering in the corner. Instead of prowling around looking for a new victim, the devil's cowering in the corner thinking, oh my goodness, I'm a bit scared of that lot. That would be a bit of a turnaround in circumstances, wouldn't it? It's all about getting ready for Christ's return. I want to tell you, folks, Christ is not coming back for a slumbering church keeping warm under a duvet. Christ is coming back for a glorious and spotless bride. A glorious and spotless bride that has been refined by the fire of the Holy Spirit. A church that stands for truth regardless of the cost. Wherever you're operating, whatever part of your life. So I wonder how, how do you need to respond to this alarm call? Maybe you've been, you know, you've been slumbering a bit and you know you need to wake up. Maybe you know that if the war were to come right now, you're not ready. And you need to do something to get ready. You have not gone through those stages of preparedness. Maybe you are not on the alert and you know that you need to be more alert. Well, folks, whatever it is, I want to urge you to take action, to choose to take that action that is needed in your life today. You can't wish away the circumstances that we're in. You can't pretend it's all sweetness and flowers as we skip through the meadows on a warm summer's day, as pleasant as that may be. Being awake, being ready, being alert, it's all about being prepared for what's coming. Once we're prepared, we can fight the war, which we'll look at more this evening. Do come back, it's crucial to hear the second part of things there. But for now, let's focus on what we all need to do to prepare. Mary and the band, if you come forward, please. I said from the outset, these three words, restoring, refreshing, reviving. God is in the business of restoring. Maybe you feel today like you've had your life sucked away. You feel a failure. Well, I want to tell you today, God can restore all things to you. He can restore your marriage. He can restore your health. He can restore your wealth. He can restore anything that the devil has sucked away from you. Well, Genesis 50 and 20 says that what the enemy meant for evil, God will turn it for good. What the enemy tried to take, God will turn it around for his good. The enemy comes to kill, steal, and destroy. But God has given us life. And life in all its abundance. All things, Romans 8, 28, work together for the good of those who love God and accord according to his purpose. Maybe you need a refreshing. Well, folks, he'll give you a fresh dose of his Holy Spirit spiritual energy. He'll revitalize your prayer life. He'll teach you to praise him in every circumstance. Maybe you need a revival in your life today. He'll set you on fire for him once again for a fresh outpouring of the Holy Spirit. No more quenching of the Spirit and your life from this day forwards. I want to ask you three questions here in closing. Maybe you're here today and you've never actually met Jesus. And you're sitting there today and you're thinking, well, who is this Jesus he talks about? What is this Holy Spirit? What are all these technical terms? Well, folks, it's very, very simple. The Bible says that the wages of sin are death. And it says also that all have fallen short of the glory of God. But you see, fortunately, that first verse where it talks about death being the price for sin doesn't stop there because it carries on and it says that the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus. 
And you can come to Jesus today and you can start on that path of being equipped for what is coming down the line. Doesn't make you exempt from what's coming down the line, but it makes you be able to withstand and withstand when the test comes. Allow Jesus to come into your heart and he'll change you. Now and onwards. He is the restorer. Maybe you've known Jesus for a while and you, you just, you've grown distant from him. You've been asleep and you know that you need to come back to Jesus. But he is the reviver. Or maybe you need his help to prepare you for coming days. Maybe you, you feel a bit afraid. Maybe you look at the headlines and you, you just feel that you can't go on. And you just feel like you want to just bury your head in the sand. Well, he is the refresher. He's the restorer. He's the reviver. He's the refresher. That's what he's in the business of doing. And so I want to ask you this morning, if you don't know Jesus, would you just slip your hand up if you want to meet Jesus today? I'm going to give an opportunity there. And maybe you need to rekindle your fire for Jesus. Maybe you need to rekindle that flame that was there. There's still a little bit of a wick of a candle, but it's not burning bright. You need that reviving. You need to grow back closer to Jesus. Maybe you need his help to prepare for the coming days. Well, we're going to sing a song in closing here. And as we sing that, if you want prayer, if you want to get back close to God, if you want to be awakened if you know that you need to be awake, if you know that you've been slumbering, if you know that you need to take steps to prepare for what is coming, if you know that you have not been alert and you want to be alert, then come forward. We're going to anoint you with oil. We're going to pray over you and we're going to leave the rest to God and the Holy Spirit is going to come and do something in your life afresh and anew this day. Father, we thank you for your message here this morning. We thank you, Lord, that you are a living and active God, that you're not distant, that you are right here, right beside us. And Father, I ask right now that you would speak to our hearts. I pray, Lord Jesus, that you would cause us to respond in that which way we need to this morning. Father, I pray that you would equip us for that which is coming. I pray that you would build us up, Lord Jesus, that we would be ready that we would be awake and we would be alert to the things that are coming down the line so that we're not caught off guard, so that we're not found wanting, so that we will be prevailing in times of trial. And that will be a testimony to those around us and they too will turn to you. Thank you, Lord Jesus. In Jesus' name we pray.